It means that I can't see your face, but you can you can see mine. Okay, so let's let's uh, we're a little early, um, so I'm just going to fill the space a little bit just to, some, for some introduction. Um, I, one of the things I'm finding interesting is that in these kinds of talks, I've been delivering talks about GPU programming for a long time. Prior to this, with OpenMP, and now with Sickle, and the audience keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It's sort of indicative of the trend that GPU programming is really beginning to hit hit mainstream. So. I'm really glad that to see a really um, big reception. But at the beginning, I was able to talk to a fairly empty hall, so if I make mistakes, nobody noticed. Now, unfortunately, you guys are going to all know what's going to happen. So today, we're going to talk a little bit about modern um, GPUs and how to program them. Um, but not just um, in any unique proprietary way, but I want to talk about how to program it using very standard C++, because after all, I'm really a C++ standard guy. I wear several hats now. Um, I work in the C++ standard. I work in the Chrono specification standard. I chair Sickle, which is their heterogeneous C++ programming language. I'm a member, I've been a member of C++ for a long time, but beneath, and I've, I'm chairing a number of groups that's involved with some form of, um, of GPU and heterogeneous programming. Um, but underneath of all this, I do have a deep history back um, of about 20, 25 years working at IBM as a research scientist, working at OpenMP. Um, so I actually came from a high-performance community, high-performance computing community, recently transitioning into autonomous vehicles, consumer, consumer devices. So now I really am seeing both sides of the fence in a way. Um, so this work is actually written by myself and my colleague, Gordon Brown, who is not here with us today. Um, and it's similar to talks that we have extended and delivered. There's a bunch of standard boilerplates about what we do and why, I, why I'm here. I do work for this now, work for a UK company now, a Scottish company in Edinburgh. My entire team is in Edinburgh. I'm actually still in Canada. But ACC is the perfect conference to talk about the, some of the technology that the UK has developed because we do, do deliver a lot of solutions originally for graphics, like the physics um, processors in games. But now, but these processors now, these graphics processors now are transitioning into machine learning processors for, for things like autonomous vehicles, for advanced drive, um, uh, uh, driver assistance. And in these are the places where GPU programming, um, efficient GPU programming is necessary. So that's why um, one of the reasons why um, I've, I've been involved. So I always like to break up my talks into three parts because I think that when I look at talks, I really get a cognitive overload when I see just so many topics being involved. So I really only talk about three things. Now, each one of these could be somewhat involved. Um, we're going to talk about what's still missing in C++. We're going to talk about what makes GPUs work so fast. Now, the picture I have here is a little bit incongruous. It's actually from my um, LLVM keynote from last year, where I actually talk about the problems of heterogeneous programming. Having done it for almost 15 years now, I feel like we really know what the problems are and some of the best solutions that we can achieve up to this date. So that's why you actually see the four horsemen of the apocalypse. I hope I'm not offending anybody here. <laughs> that's particularly religious. Um, and we're gonna talk about what's modern C++ that can work on GPUs, CPUs, and pretty much everything. So what's still missing in, from C++? Um, just a bit of a recap, I know you didn't sign up for this, but I want to recap what, CP, what, what we've achieved so far in C++20, which is many of you guys, and myself included, I see Roger, I see a few people, other people who's from the standard committee. What we did achieve in C++20 is that we've got concepts, uh, both the convenient syntax and the original syntax. We have contracts, uh, we have ranges, we have coroutines, and we have modules. What we didn't get was reflection, and what we didn't get, and I was really hoping, was executors. We had a good chance, but towards the end, we just kind of erred on the side of caution. Um, because executors, because networking depends on executors, we really would have gotten, we, we might have gotten networking if we got executors, but that's not the case either. And upcoming after executors, there, will be a new, there should be a new version of async, and a, a newer version of future.den. So why do I bring up all of this stuff? It's because it's now becoming increasingly clear what the right abstraction is when you're programming C++ for parallelism, 
and heterogeneity. If you're using cores or hardware threads, you really should be using C++ 11, 14, 17 threads. Multiple people at this conference and at other conferences have talked about what choices you should make. You can use things like async. If you really want to know how many hardware threads you have, there's this thing called hardware concurrency. If you're using vectors, before C++ 20, there wasn't any. There was just parallelism TS2. Okay, and then if you're using atomics and fences and things like that, there's a bunch of TS. There's C++ 11, 14, 17 atomics. If you're using parallel loops, there are things like async. Okay, but until now, um, and, and uh, um, until now, there was also C++ 14, uh, 17 parallel parallel algorithms. Um, if you're doing heterogeneous offload to some GPU devices, there really isn't anything in the standard that, that gives you that uh, this ability. You pretty much have to go outside of the standard and use well-known practitioners' uh, frameworks like OpenCL, Sickle, HSA, uh, OpenMP, OpenACC, which I, where I came from, to some, not ACC, but OpenMP. Cocos, Raja, if you're in the US Department of Energy, okay, they have formed their own frameworks on these things. If you want to do distributed computer, that is distributed computing, like node-to-node -node computing, you would want to do something, you probably have heard of MPI, okay? You would probably use something called, but if it's very C++ specific, it would have to be something like HPX from Louisiana State University. There's also something called UPC++. If you want to use caches, C++ 17 actually has false sharing support. How many people know that? Okay, somebody should give a talk on those hardware, those, those hardware um, uh, features, um, that, um, APIs that allow you to do caches, control caches. If you want to do NUMA, there is nothing. Okay, there's not anything that you can do to control the non-uniform memory access of your system. If you're doing, if you want to do threat local storage, other than on a CPU, there's nothing. Okay, there's, uh, I didn't put it down there, but I should actually, when I adjust my slide. There's threat local, which gives you access to the CPU in a threat local manner, but not on GPUs or on anything else. Um, if you want to do exception handling, it's really only available in a sequential environment and not in a concurrent environment. These empty area space is the stuff that I work on, the stuff that I have constant telecon calls with, with experts around the world on how to, how to work on these things. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk to you guys about um, is just a kind of a crash course on task versus data parallelism. I know some of you guys may be familiar with this, but essentially the idea is that you want to maximize the utilization of the hardware and reduce dependencies. How you design your algorithms is going to vary depending on whether you're describing task or data parallelism. So task parallelism, you usually have few large tasks with different operations, that, and it's, it's about control flow, and it's usually optimizing for latency. And in the case of data parallelism, you're going to have things where you have many small tasks with the same operations on multiple data. In these cases, you're going to optimize for throughputs. Now, right off the bat, I want to talk about some of these terminologies. I know they get thrown around a lot. They're kind of like the blind man with feeling the elephant. They, do they really mean somewhat similar things? Well, let me just put it this way. Um, latency is going to be the amount of time, in this particular case, um, that it takes to travel through the tube. And bandwidth is basically how wide that tube is. And if you were f moving water, for instance, through the tube, the amount of water you would move through would be your throughput. Um, the definition isn't particularly interesting. What I want to do is go through an example that many of us are familiar with, especially in, the, in North America, and I suspect similarly here. We have, in North America, we have this institution called the DMV, the Department of Motor Vehicle. I'm sure there's a similar one in the UK. And have you ever noticed that when you go to this particular institution, the lines are extra long, and you pretty much want to reserve your lunch hour plus another hour to go do whatever operation you want to do at this place? Well, that's how it is in, in, in North America. The question is, what's wrong with this? What's wrong with these people? You always go there. Why is it that I have to wait so long? Well, the, the thing is that the thing is that it depends on what you're optimizing for, and it turns out that what you want to optimize for is different one than what the DMV is optimizing for. Your goal is basically optimizing for latency. That is, you want to have the, to spend the least amount of time there, right? I mean, nobody wants to spend any more time than they have to. And CPUs are optimized for latency, so they minimize the amount of time per task. Now, the DMV, the Department of Motor Vehicles goal, is not your goal. Okay? They're optimizing for throughput. 
they wanted to have, they, they're looking at the number of, serves, serves, uh, number of people they serve per day. And they, want, they actually want long lines to keep their employees busy. Okay? They do not want actually the lines to be short. So this gives you an idea why that CPU and GPUs are actually designed differently. To, uh, to the point where they're nearly on the opposite end of a spectrum. The GPUs are optimized for throughput. They are like the DMV, okay? The CP and, so, uh, and, and when you have latency, it lags the bandwidth. So in computer graphics, for instance, we care about the pixels per second um, more than the latency of any one particular pixel. We're willing to make the processing of one pixel made that, and take two times longer as long as we get lots of pixels going. Okay. Now, now you finally understand why it is that you will always wait a long time at the DMV. So you will hear in this, this area as the, the state of the art about what's generally known as Flynn's taxonomy. And in Flynn's taxonomy, there are these things called um, single instruction, single data, uh, single instruction, multiple data. And then further on there, you'll have things like multiple instruction, single data, which is weird and multiple instructions, multiple data. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that because it's important to understand that essentially all this means is that in single instruction, single data, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a sequential computer that exploits no parallelism, either in the instruction or the data stream. There's a single control unit that fetches a single instruction from memory, and then the control unit then generates the appropriate control signals to direct single processing elements to operate on single data stream. Um, on the other hand, something like a SIMD is the beginning of parallelism, where it represents the organization of a single computer controlling a control unit, processing unit, and a memory unit, or something like that. And the instructions are executed sequentially, but it can be achieved by pipelining on multiple, um, multiple functioning units. If you have Multiple instructions, uh, SIMD, that's a little bit weird. This is a pretty uncommon architecture. And it might be used for things like, uh, before you think it doesn't exist, it does. It's used for things like fault tolerance, for instance. Um, heterogeneous systems could operate on the same data stream and has to agree on the result. And if they all agree, then you have fault tolerance. If they don't agree, something's wrong. The space shuttle is actually something, a good example of something like that. Then finally, you have multiple instructions, multiple data, which is multiple autonomous processors, and simultaneously um, executing different instructions on different data. Um, these kinds of multiple uh, MIMD architectures include things like multi-core superscalar pro processors and distributed systems. They are using either, either one shared memory space or distributed memory space, okay? So, when you look at what kind of processor we should build, you see that they, the, the designers, the CPUs and GPUs, are aiming for different things. For CPUs, they tend to be small number of processors, of large processors. Um, that's the world I came from the last 20 years of my life. Um, there's more control, there's less processing, and it requires more power. They're optimized for latency. That's what you guys generally used to want. These days, you now are asking for more GPU kinds of processors, and that's something that I've been involved with also for about 15 years. These are large numbers of small processors with less control, with a lot more processing. They require less power, and they're optimized purely for throughputs. Okay? And they optimize especially for the type of computation that's a SIMD, single instructions and multiple data. They almost all have some sort of vector processing unit that allows you to do that. When you combine a lot of these either multiple G CPU cores and GPU cores together, you get heterogeneity. In a multi-core CPU, each core might be optimized for a single thread, this, this fast serial processing. You might be, it has to be good at everything, and you pretty much have to minimize the latency of one thread with lots of big chips, big chip caches with sophisticated controls, okay? So SIMD architectures essentially just basically means using data parallelism, okay? Um, it basically has an improved trade-off with the area and power, and the parallelism is exposed to programmers and the, and the compiler. It's hard for compilers actually, so when I was a compiler writer for many, many years, um, the dream was always to get something called auto-vectorization, to have your code automatically be vectorized. It turns out that that's actually quite difficult um, because there's so many different kinds of vector instruction sets out there. In fact, Intel themselves has probably about eight, 
when I used to work at IBM, we had three ourselves, and almost every other company, including AMD, has several forms of these. And what's worse is these instructions are getting wider and wider and bigger and bigger. They're not necessarily compatible with the previous ones, making it very difficult for compilers to figure out what is the right size. And so over time, this has been not, this has been, that's why it's called a hard knocks. It hasn't been easy to achieve any of these things. The other thing, so before you, th if you think about it, it turns out that a lot of um, many core GPUs is basically a device for turning a compute bound problem into basically what's called a memory bound problem. There are lots of processors, but there's only one socket and the memory concerns dominate the performance tuning. Now, the memory is actually in some sort of SIMD um, manner as well, too. So you have SIMD loads in store that are more efficient, that are most efficient at, the, at, at a vector size alignment. Okay. And the compiler is going to generate a scalar peeling loop for the first few iterations until it reaches a vector boundary. And then it's going to generate a scalar remainder loop for the last few iterations. Um, and then um, for the, that, that doesn't fit into a vector. And there are different arrays that have different algorithms and the performance and code side trade, trade, trade offs uh, for calculating all of these things. Most of the efficient vector code is when data arrays are multiple vector length and size and is aligned to the vector boundary. And then and the compiler also knows that it is aligned. The other thing that is going to happen is that you also make sure you have to pad properly. Okay, so SIMD loads and store instructions are most efficient on contiguous homogeneous data. Data. So if you have an array of structures, that's usually less efficient than a structure of arrays because a structure of arrays is actually all contiguous within each array itself until you switch to a different array. Okay. So you. So what happens is that because GPU prefers. Um, um, uh, SOA versus instead of an array of structures, when you move things between CPUs and GPU, it will be necessary to transform the data. If it's in an AOS, you would have to re you would have to invert it inside out. So these are some of the things that we we need to do, and that's why now you start seeing what I mean when I say the four horsemen of the apocalypse. After working with GPUs for so many years, it's pretty clear that what you need to do is you have to make data movement very efficient because ultimately you're going to be moving data between a CPU to a GPU. You have to make sure that the data layout is efficient. Is it the case that, um, is it the case that data is laid out contiguously like they do in a CPU vector or an array? Or is it the case that you might have um, you might need data to be laid out in some sort of strided manner because on a GPU you have to do what's called because you have many processing units accessing different elements at different strides, you have to pull them out from slightly different offsets, coalesce them back together so that the GPU can have just a straight line access to all of these things. This is effectively some of the, 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 the horsemen that we're talking about. The other horsemen is that on CPUs, you're pretty familiar, familiar with the fact that the OS manages some of the affinity for you. The OS, in some cases, make it easy for you to get the data, or in some cases, the OS ensures that you have the data close to your computation to some extent. Okay, still not to a full extent, unless you use some, comp uh, some sort of machine-specific um, instructions. But on GPUs, they have no OS guarantees on any of those affinity. You basically have to move data around to make sure that it's close to where you want it. It's a lot less than what the GCPUs do. So, this is why it's important to understand these, dif these, these differences in the design so that you can know how to program them efficiently. And the rest of this talk is going to be about the solutions that we get at. So I always want to step back and look at the power of computing aligning with the, the delivery of C++ standards. Um, so I, I always want to look at two or three periods of time. So I remember I was involved just at the end when C++ 98 um, was released. Okay, and then I was I was I started getting so that was pretty much when I was involved, and I somehow for some odd reason tends to buy a brand new computer for my house for my own personal use when that happens. And so in 1998, anybody remember the Pentium 2? I bought one of those. <laughs> it had only 0.45 gigaflops. That was pretty much the last chip that had any that, that had no SIMD unit at all. Yes, back on that Pentium 2, there was no vector units. And there was no GPUs either to buy at that time. Quake had just become popular. 
Okay, anyone play Quake here? I remember those times. It's certainly, I certainly wild away a lot of my time playing that stuff. So here's what happened. So for, for a long time, um, we've been satisfied with mostly, we're pretty much accessing uh, using standard C++. C++ and on pretty much only on, on either only one core. And back then, honestly, um, C++ 98 or even C99, and, or if you use Fortran, um, God bless you if you do, um, that those languages fit the, the, the hardware perfectly. You couldn't access any more than that anyway. C++ 98 was single-threaded. You could access your 0.45 gigaflops Okay, your single core very, very efficiently using C++ or C or Fortran. Now, by 2011, when C++ 11 was released, I had been involved in C++ by then over for about 10 years. C++ 11 took actually a lot more than 10 years. <laughs> by then, the world had pretty much accelerated beyond what C++ 11 offered. Okay, at that time, I bought myself an Intel Core i7 that could support four cores and 80 gigaflops. Um, to program it, I had to do something beyond C++ to get all the gigaflops. I might need to use some maybe OpenMP, I might have to use some thread building blocks, I might have to use Silk or OpenCL. OpenCL had just been released in 2008. Or I might need to use CUDA, for instance. Because on these things, so for CPU, I could do that. But if I wanted to program the vector unit, nothing in C++ was going to give that to me. I had to use um, vendor intrinsics, I had to use OpenCL, I had to use CUDA, or some sort of, auto, um, or I have to wish that the auto vectorization in my compiler works. If I want to program a GPU, and I did, I bought myself one of these NVIDIA 6, uh, 680 graphics cards, top of the line in 2011, cost like about $500. Um, but boy, if I wanted to program it, nothing when C++ was going to help me. I definitely would have to use CUDA because that was an NVIDIA card. But I could also use OpenCL. OpenCL works on NVIDIA. Um, I could use OpenGL, maybe DirectX. And back then, C++ AMP was very, had just started becoming, uh, coming online. Moving fast forward to C++ 17, Again, in 2017, maybe it's because of the hard work of, on the standard, after it, G, uh, after it was ratified, I decided I needed to buy myself a new machine again. I actually did. I bought myself um, one of these, um, well, it was certainly an Intel Core i9, um, or i7, I can't remember what it, what, what it is. But I bought myself one of these NVIDIA 1080 graphics cards because I was told that, you know, if I wanted to, to see what VR looks, or the virtual reality looks like, I needed one of these, these top of the line 1080 graphics cards. And the thing was that these 1080 graphics cards, so the, G, the CPU by then offered me about 140 gigaflops, quite a significant, a little bit of an improvement on the 80 gigaflops that my, my, uh, my Core 2 actually gave me. Um, my vector units offered me 560 gigaflops on the AVX unit, because by then it was 512, versus the 140 gigaflops that the 256 AVX gave me. My GPU has really lapped. It, it, nearly, it literally doubled from 2,500 gigaflops to 4,600 gigaflops. A huge improvement, doubling of speed. To program them, Things haven't changed all that much from C++11. C++17 also didn't give me a whole lot. If I'm doing the CPU, I can still use pretty much exactly the same programming model. If I wanted to program the vector unit, this great AVX 512 that I had, again, nothing in C++ would give it to me. Um, the only thing I had could recourse to was something from Sicko, some sort of vendor intrinsics, and OpenCL, CUDA, OpenMP, or auto vectorization again. If I wanted to program the GPU, again, nothing in C++ would give it to me. It would have to be SQL, CUDA, OpenCL, and because it's a graphics unit, you can use the graphics languages like DirectX or OpenGL, or some sort of intrinsics. And by then, I had charted OpenMP to support um, um, to, um, offload targets for accelerators. So you could use, in, in practice, OpenMP. So what, what is this telling you? This is telling me that you see the, the huge difference in terms of what the CPU gives you. And if you're only programming in the CPU, the amount of performance you are literally leaving on the floor. Okay? That 
there's a huge amount that's in the vector unit and an even bigger amount in the GPU that you're not, act you're not actually making available to your program. So why is it that you're not using it? Well, part of it is we haven't made it easy for you. If you go back and look at the Moore's Law, and I'm sure you guys know about, uh, all about the Moore's Law now that this free lunch is over, the real explosion that's been happening is that there's now, all it, the future is, is definitely in parallelism and heterogeneity. There are basically GPUs everywhere now. They're, they're in your cell phones, in your TV, they're, they're in your cars. These days, if it weren't for GPUs, machine learning would not achieve the status that it has right now. Well, effectively, it is translating your words, um, listening to you in your living room, <laughs> unfortunately, um, and also being able to give you Google Maps and identifications and things like that. They're all because of the explosions of GPUs. So what's going on there? If you now look at hardware, you see that if you take a typical Intel chip, chip of the Core i7, that's a 7 gen, you have four CPU cores, each one with hyper-threading, each one with 8Y AVX instructions, and the GPU will have something like, and these Intel chips now have built-in GPUs, um, as opposed to, say, the discrete GPUs you might get from NVIDIA or AMD. These GPU now have about 1,280 1, processing elements. Serial code C++ fits just in that little green area there on your chip, okay? It only takes advantage of a very small amount of that available space. If you vectorize it and that those vectors run on a CPU, it takes approximately half of, that C of, of one of those four CPU cores. You'll see that today's would cause um, you can certainly program this stuff with C++ 11 and 14 and 17. If you want to know how many threads you can handle, you would have to query hardware concurrency, which is a C++ standard API, okay? So that now you can access the multiple cores on your machine. And again, we have that facility. What's coming is that we want to be able to access the bottom half of this chip, the heterogeneous dispatch that allows you to utilize the full chip. But again, I would say that it's not really your fault because GPU programming has up till now been a little bit of a niche programming. It's more, the, the, the way to program it has not been easy. This is, a, this is, this is, this is hello world in the GPU world. <laughs> it's like hello universe actually. <laughs> um, and it's actually OpenCL, CUDA is not that, that, that much simpler, okay? They're usually very limited to fairly specific domain Okay, um, they might um, they might separate. They might have separate source versus the kernel code. This is what's been traditionally been explored with. So since I've been pretty much a, a language designer for about 25 years, I've lived through these times where you would have separate source, separate GPU code, and we tried that because we thought that gee, that would make it a lot easier to understand. You know that this code is running on the GPU and this code is running on the CPU. Well, at the end, we realized this is not the right way to go. It totally destroys type safety. You cannot type check between code that is running on the CPU and run that, is, that code is running on the GPU because they're in a totally different translation unit, okay? And then the other thing is that they tend to be very verbose. Every statement to the GPU, you have to tell it exactly how to move the data, when to move it, when to move it back, when to synchronize it. There's a lot of barriers that's going on. And you have to manually do what the calling conventions do, like setting arguments, copying data. So here's a slide from a talk that I'm going to, talk, I'm going to give um, in another conference where I talk about how much C++ has achieved. And what I've, what I've separated out is what C++ has achieved for parallelism and concurrency. Um, you can separate out into multiple um, vertical columns of asynchronous agents, concurrent collections, and mutable shared state. Now I added one more column for heterogeneous, uh, for GPUs, accelerators, and embedded artificial intelligent processors. And you see that each one were given different amounts of features um, by the C++ standard. Now, just to get you familiarized with what all these terms might mean, if you're talking about an asynchronous agent, the key there is that you want tasks that run independently and communicate through messages. A key example of that is like a printer, where when you press print, you don't want your screen to suddenly freeze up. You want to be keep on doing something. That's an asynchronous agent that's been dispatched to some sort of print queue. 
If you have a concurrent collection, you might want operations on groups of things, um, exploiting the, the parallelism that's in your data or your algorithm. Okay, so so you have quick sort. You have you, you know. Um, if you have mutable shared state, this is where SG5 lived in for a long time, and SG1, SG5 is transactional memory, and SG1 um, is the concurrency group. We talk about avoiding data races. This is the space you live in if you're dealing with legacy code. Code that doesn't understand parallelism and codes that now do, and they have to synchronize with each other. Tell each other that, oh, I'm now ready. You can take my, in, my data and do something with it in parallel. Oh, now I'm ready to give it back. The idea of acquire, release, and relax, and sequentially consistent operations. The idea of fences and locks and things like that. And then on the fourth column is about offloading to completely to a different node. And I put that separately because I feel in some way this, it requires us, uh, its own, own thing. So if you look at all of this, C++11, what did it give us? In terms of asynchronous agents, it gave us things like threads, lambdas, futures, and TLS, you know, the threat local keyword. In terms of concurrent co collections, it had async, it had things like package tasks, it had promises, futures, and to some extent, atomics allowed this as well. So a feature could certainly cross columns. And if you looked at um, mutable shared states, I, we had lots of that. We had locking, we had mutex, we have condition variables, we have atomics, static initializations and terminations. Now, out of all these, I claim that the one thing that aided heterogeneity was lambda. The lambda function was designed beautifully. It was designed right from the, the, from, from the get-go for both concurrency, heterogeneity, dispatch to offload to, to distribute it, and um, heterogeneous systems. Although at the time, it wasn't recognized as such. One thing you'll notice that is that among all of these, almost all of these features are for concurrency. There's all, very little in here for parallelism, honestly. Okay, and that's because in the consumer world, it's mostly about concurrency. It's most about, mostly about communication with some other thread, telling it, I'm ready, I need a lock, I need to move forward. A lot of this actually doesn't fit well with the high performance community. In the high performance community where I came from, the world of supercomputers, exascale computing, all we, them at now at this point cared about is straight, pretty embarrassingly parallel algorithms that runs as fast as possible but don't interact with anyone else. Okay. Now over recent times, the high performance community have have, have entered the C++ standard and now are beginning to try to add more parallelism. But you can argue that with the exception of a relaxed atomics, almost all of these could be for concurrency. Relax Atomics has the parallel, has the capability that it doesn't have any barriers and locks, and it can pretty much run straight through. That's why it is a good, reasonable parallelism construct. What else is there that's interesting about all this? You might argue that, um, let me see, futures is a concurrent uh, feature. It isn't, actually. It's actually more a parallel feature. It is a concurrence feature masquerading as a parallel feature so that you can control it in a parallel way, setting a future, getting it in some parallel organized way, as opposed to having to manage the communication for you. Okay. So why is it that we care about so much getting more heterogeneity? Well, one reason from the high performance community is because of this race to excess scale computing. There was a race to, what's before exa? I think it's uh, Pico, I can't remember, but it's a thousand times less. We achieved that pretty quickly in, in um, around the year 2000. And since then, we're trying to go to the next step of exascale thing. And if I remember correctly, I think that's like 10 to the 16. Okay. The other thing is that the, the other massive change that's happened is that in the consumer world, now with machine learning and artificial intelligence, this is the only thing that's allowing them to work because before the use of GPUs, machine learning algorithm would take 35 days before it could figure out that this is a cat. With GPUs, it took... The, f the breakthrough was when it took less than five hours. Now it, took, now it takes seconds to recognize that something is a cat. I'm mentioning cat a lot because I'm told that you can always throw cats in in your presentation and there's not, never going to be anybody who disliked that. <laughs> I'm not monetizing it though, you'll understand. <laughs> so today, GPUs are definitely everywhere. And the, the, we've, we've learned a lot about GPU languages now. 
So now we today now know that separate source is not the right solution. Um, there were many um, um, programming languages that were separate source. OpenCL is still separate source. We now know that single source is the best way. Single source means that you have the host code and the kernel code in the same source file. It's hard to tell which word ones begin and one, one, the other one ends, but honestly, if you look at it after a while, you stare at it long enough, just like the C++ standard, you start seeing where the kernel code is going to be executed. And C++ is particularly good at that because of its brace coverage, allows you to see where certain scope blocks begin and end, and that's where the GPU code is going to be. The other thing is that now these things are now more accessible to the average C++ developer, meaning that the languages are at a higher level. And we've seen a lot of them now. Okay? C++ AMP was one of the early precursors coming out of Microsoft. Its downfall was that it had this restrict keyword and that it was kind of just restricted to Microsoft being implemented. If it was much widely, just widely distributed, it, would have, it might have really taken off. Sicko came out of OpenCL and it is also purely modern C++. CUDA, obviously, but it, it, it only works for one GPU, so that's not so great. The National Labs pretty much had enough of this waiting, and they basically designed their own framework. These are library frameworks. They're called Cocos and Raja. I was just at a DOE event last week talking about all of these things. Okay. And Hartmut Kaiser decided to do his own design for distributed computing called HPX. Now, all of these guys are working hard within the C++ standard to contribute what they've learned in terms of their best features to put that into the C++ standard. Not any one of these languages will dominate, thank you, thank God, but each one comes with the, their best features, and it's interesting that almost all of them solve all these problems, the four horsemen, in the same way. One other thing that, that is central to all this is what's called C++ executors. This is the one feature which, by the way, we didn't get in C++20, and I'm still kind of upset about that, <laughs> that it's going to unify execution. In one word, all executors do is to give you ability to dispatch a function. That's all it does. And one of the part part to, at convincing people to standardize is why does it have to be so complicated? Why are there 26 variants of this executors? We've, we worked hard to reduce it from down from 26 to maybe about 9 or 10, and even then it's still a lot. Fundamentally, all, all it does is it takes a bunch of parallel constructs and now you can mix and match with them with any a bunch of heterogeneous resources. Okay? If it weren't for executor acting as an interface, you would have an end by end explosion of constructs. One for um, OpenMP threads, one for C++ threads, one, you know, one for different kinds of re uh, resource. And that would just not be great. If you think about, if you understand how um, iterators marries algorithms and containers, this is exactly what executors do. They marry parallel constructs with resources. Okay? We're very close, though. It's, almost, it's now pretty much guaranteed that we're going to get some form of executors um, for 23. We're basically done um, now with that design. It got rejected at the final stage because it employed a property mechanism that was a little bit different. But I'm convinced that with some more, more work, we will be able to complete that work. So what makes a GPU work so fast? Well, both CPU and GPU um, have their own discrete memory and basically can communicate with each other. You know, the, the GPU doesn't have a main function. It basically is invoked from a, from a CPU. This is a little bit low level for people who already knows a lot about GPU, but I want to get through this for some of the people who are, who are wondering how do you program a GPU in some generic high-level C++ way. Well, first, let's understand how these guys work. So here, let's take a look at what happens. First thing you do is that the CPU is going to allocate some memory on the GPU. The CPU copies the data from the CPU to GPU. This is, no, this is inherent in every model I've worked on, whether it's OpenMP, whether it's in CUDA, whether it's in OpenCL or SQL. Every one of them will do all of these exact same, same steps. The next thing is that the CPU launches the kernel on the GPU. And then the CPU copies the data from the CPU, um, um, the data to the CPU from the GPU because you, your work is done. Now the CPU wants to find out what the, the answer is. Okay, and that's it. 
Now, the CPU architecture is something you guys are probably all familiar with. It has a region of um, dedicated memory. A CPU is connected, to, um, that's the, 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 the memory is connected to the CPU through some kind of a bus. And you, know, you might have several cores in a CPU host. Okay, and the CPU has a number of caches of different levels, and in some cases, your operating system does a pretty good job of getting your data close to your thread of computation. In other cases, it is it doesn't. Okay, but today you're, you're a little bit familiar with that, and you're kind of expecting that's to happen. And then in, the, in, in each CPU core has a dedicated register. Okay, now a GPU is a little bit different but it's a little bit the same as well too. So here's a GPU and the GPU memory. A GPU has a region of dedicated global memory. That's like the main memory of a CPU. Then the global memory is connected via a bus. Same, nothing, nothing's different there. Now a GPU is divided into a number of compute units. I've only drawn two here, but in actual reality, where CPU cores now only get up to eight, you might be able to buy one with 16, and if you're like in the Department of Energy, the National Lab, you can get one with 256,000 CPU cores. GPUs that you buy starts at 256,000 cores, okay? And then they go to millions. That's the real bang for the buck. Each of these compute units has dedicated local memory. This is like the private register file of your CPU. Um, but what happens is that each of these compute units has a number of processing elements as well. This is where the C this is where it's close to what a CPU is, these processing elements. And then each processing element might have their own further dedicated private memory. So you really have three memory regions here. You have the private memory, you have the local memory for a group of compute units, and you have a global memory that every unit can access. Now obviously, um, there's different latency here. Okay. Um, on the CPU, the caches are basically managed by the OS, like I said. But on the GPU, you have to explicitly control the locality of your data. Because GPUs have smaller control structures, and they're optimized for throughput. It's, they're the DMV. They want to get things through as fast as, pos as possible. They want the queue to be constantly lined up with work. So in the CPU, I'm using OpenCL terminology, but NVIDIA terminology, CUDA terminology is similar. Um, there's a process element that's like a very small CPU core, or, and in this case, there's a thread. And so that's why today we start talking about things like lightweight threads, green threads, or whatever. You see, the, when the, in the C++ standard, when we say stood thread, it's not about this thread. It's about the thread that you get on a CPU, which we expect to come with lots of stack sizes, um, lots of, you know, so, uh, the whole register file maybe spilling over. These threads barely have any stack at all, okay? And no registers allow, uh, uh, associated with them. That's why they're very lightweight threads. So in the C, in the C++ standard, you, st you start seeing now in the C++ standard, we no longer talk about stood thread, we talk about execution agents. We change the terminology so that we can now accept these di very different kinds of cores and different kinds of threads. Okay. Then what happens is there's a private memory that's associated with it, and this is a unique memory region for each of the work item. It's very small, usually just a some stack, and it's very close to the processing unit, so it's very low latency. Um, a compute unit would be called a work group, and it might contain usually four or eight or 16 of these processing elements, okay? It would have, the compute unit would have access to the local memory that's available to all the work items within a work group. The larger, um, they're usually larger, and it's usually for sharing a partial results. I'm gonna later on demonstrate a reduction algorithm, and in it you'll see, and if you know how reductions work, you'll know that in a normal parallel reduction, you need to accumulate some partial results before you find, get to the final answer. So they're close to the processing element, so they have low latency, not as low as the private memory, but still still pretty decent. And when you launch a kernel, you launch a large number of these compute units, okay? And these compute, this entire, all of these compute units would have access to global memory. This is available to all the work items within a kernel, 
It's much larger. It's for passing data in and out of a kernel. And it's generally very far from the processing element, so it's much higher latency. The private memory is small, obviously, and so that's why it has, and it's very close to the, the processing element, so that's why it's a low latency. The local memory is larger, and it's for sharing across work, work items so, and used for partial results. So if you have an accumulate or reduction, that's where you want to put some of the data. Now let's take a look at the multiple work items, how they're going to execute concurrently. So now we have to understand how, what's the behavior of a GPU execution. So let's say for a GPU, we might have multiple work items. Each one of these are processing elements. Um, that's going to execute concurrently. They are, but the one thing is that they're not guaranteed to all execute uniformly. So some might finish earlier, some might finish later. So a number is going to execute together with the same instruction. This is what's called a warp in NVIDIA, CUDA technology, or it's called a wavefront in OpenCL or otherwise Intel technology implement, um, speak. So this little square here is a warp or a wavefront. They execute in what's called lockstep with each other. They do that because they want to make sure that they, they don't get into a data race with other warps, okay? And, that's, and the other warp would be on the other side of this thing. This is what happens. Here, each work item is independent on the result of the adjacent work item, okay? But except in this last case, as we get down to the bottom, you see that here, this warp has, um, is, needs to wait for data from this particular guy, which hasn't executed, so there's a data race that could be happening. So this is a normal thing with, 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 CP, with GPUs, and all GPU models have ways of solving this problem. They have something called a work group barrier, and all it does is essentially uh, synchronize um, between work groups so that you make sure a complete work group is finished, even though different warps are arriving at different times, all the warps are finished, now you can continue on. That's why it's called a, that's why it's called a lockstep. Okay, so the work items is going to block until all the work items in the work group has reached that point. Now, you can effectively say that you can be sure that all the results that you're looking for, that you want to read from, have been written to, and now you can take that result. Okay, I guess one thing I can think about is that if you are, it's almost like as if you were traveling on an airplane, a big airplane, like an A380. I know they're discontinued here. But it's in, in that particular case, you can bring a lot of people over the Atlantic because it's a wide-body jet, unlike, the, let's say, the 737, which I won't mention. But in this particular case, an A380 is superior because it has much greater throughput, okay? Many more passengers per trip going across. The only disadvantage is that you all have to do the same thing on this airplane. If you, one person wants to eat, you all kind of have to eat. If one person wants to go to a bathroom, you all have to go to the bathroom. It's not a great airplane, I admit, but that's what essentially what this is, what this is kind of like. <laughs> now, there are these things called, it's, it is very, so there are these things that, are, that can, um, um, so these, 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 um, these work group barriers um, do, does not apply across work groups boundaries. Okay, because if they did, then you would actually have a data race again. We do have things called kernel barriers that allows you to, um, um, to synchronize between kernels. They're a little bit expensive. Um, they're not efficient because they use global memory and they have overhead for launching the kernel. This is because the local memory is not persistent between different kernel invocations. So because the you can't rely on the local memory, you actually have to use sh put shared data into global memory. And that's a lot higher latency. Then you, there's the overhead of launching multiple kernels in order to make sure data synchronizes across kernels. So by and large, in our industry, we really avoid kernel, kernel barriers. But they do work. Um, the problem, um, you know, you can still uh, be sure that all of the, the results that you want to read have been written to, and then the kernel barriers basically have just, a, just something that a higher order that you have to pay, pay for. So just to recap, we have work items that's collected into work groups, um, kernel executing multiple work groups, um, work groups that synchronizes by work group barriers, the kernels are synchronized by kernel barriers, and then each work item can access its own private memory, the local memory of its work group, and the global memory.
Okay. So let's take a look at code now, finally. Um, we're like 250. So we got about, about 40 minutes, I think. And we can now take a look at code and eventually some SQL code. So how do you write GPU code? You basically have to think a little differently. For instance, in this case, I want to square the values in an array. Okay. On the left side is your standard sequential CPU loop for squaring values of an array, pretty much in order calculation. The GPU operates in what's called a SPIMD manner, okay? single processor, multiple data. I'm going to talk about that next. You basically write your code for GPU as if it was sequential. That's the beauty of this code. It actually looks sequential. A single iteration of, it, it, you do it just in a single iteration of a loop, but it's dispatched many number of times, okay? And this, this, the number of times it dispatched is based on this parallel algorithm, the, um, the policy, okay? So that this actual thing is now gonna be in parallel. That's the magic that's going on here. So what's SPIMD? We talked about what SIMD is, single instruction, multiple data. That's the fundamental of what a vector is. Okay, so a SPIMD is basically on the other end of the spectrum a little bit. It's not that far from SIMD. It's saying that it has multiple autonomous processors simultaneously executing the same program, but, at it, but as independent unit, um, at independent points rather than in lockstep the way SIMD does. You see, when a single SIMD, they have to be in lockstep, but outside of that, you don't have to be in lockstep. These are the warps, remember? So, but they're all on different data. So these are also, this is what's called single process, multiple data. And this terminology in SPIMD is, is kind of what essentially is parallel execution model and assumes multiple cooperating processors executing a program. So SPIMD is what the general system is going to be called when it has multiple SIMD units. Okay. This is pretty much the most common style of parallel programming these days. And the GPUs are full of these things. Now, how do they do it? When you launch a kernel on a GPU, you have to specify what's called an ND range. An ND range specifies the number of work items and, then, and the work groups you want to execute on the GPU. So in this particular case, this is made up of a global range that's total, that is the total number of work items. And in this case, I'm using a 12 by 12. Okay, very much like a matrix. And the local range, which is the size of each work group, and it has to be uniform. So for instance, you, in this case, I've divided the work group into a, a three by three, where in each work group is a four by four of processing elements. I can't use some bad numbers like two by three or something like that. That's what I mean by uniform, right? Um, so the local range, which is the size of each work group, has to be uniform and basically it has to be dividable into the global into the global range Okay, these are some of the limitations you have to do in my plain analogy That pretty much means that you guys have to pretty much sit in a square matrix of some kind Okay now next one. This has to be mapped to a hardware um, In the processing elements of the GPU which may be more or now you might, in some cases, you might have more or less actual hardware elements. And this is why people talk about occupancy a lot, okay? It's important to make sure that you literally use up ex almost exactly as close to the hardware that it has as much as possible in your ND range. If you use too much, what's gonna happen is it's gonna duplicate some of these, some of the extra runover work onto the same um, processing elements. If you give it too little work, your ND range is too small, you're gonna have extra processing element that's basically sitting idle and doing absolutely nothing. So again, this is where the art and the skill of programming GPU comes in. Here's, here's what happens. When you're running, you need to say what the index range you're in, okay? And that's what that square calculation with ID in it says. And there are a bunch of number of different queries that you can get. For, for instance, this particular process element can be identified in some way, okay? And in this case, all of these, the global range is a 12 by 12 uh, matrix. The local range is a four by four, okay, matrix. The group range is a three by three, Okay, the local, the glo so with that knowledge, the global ID is, a, is six five, the local ID is two one, and the group ID is one one. So in this particular very clear matrix-like way, you can identify every single particular processing element, and that's mapped to, the, to um, in a simpler way to your data, okay? So let's take a look at the specific um, 
um, GPU programming model called Sickle. And the reason I picked Sickle is, first of all, obviously, I'm more familiar with, with it because I'm the chair of it. And also, it uses um, modern C++. Its original design philosophy is it doesn't extend anything beyond C++. It doesn't add anything. Everything looks like a library call. Now, you guys probably know that in C++, something that looks like a library can be done by the front-end compiler. Okay? So some of these library calls, even though they look like a, a library call, it's usually is actually done by a Clang front end that we have modified to do the work. So that's why we can get away with this stuff. Um, so it's basically a cross-platform. It's a high-level source language, source uh, programming language. It's not from the C++ standard. It's hosted by the Chrono standard. Chronos has been, over time, always been kind of associated with the graphics standards like OpenGL and DirectX. So recently, they've taken on this heterogeneous programming um, as a second part of their thing. But well, they've always had it, except it was called OpenCL. But we didn't like OpenCL that much because it's separate source, and we wanted to change it to use a single source um, so that we can do type checking. And that the other thing was we want to make sure that whereas OpenCL follows C99, we follow C++ 98, C++ 11, 14, and it's now following up to 17. Meaning that it can accept pretty much any C++ 17 programs, but it can now also dispatch to any heterogeneous GPU FPGA devices. So the high level, what it does is that by doing th this, it abstracts over all the boilerplate codes. Remember that enormous line of hello world code that you saw? All of that now can be contracted back into a single SQL program, and you can get back the, the normal hello world that you're used to. Okay? plus about two or three other lines that I'm going to show you. It enables clever, but it also do more than that. It enables clever things like allowing you to schedule kernels and data based on the data movement and the dependencies. And that's, I think that's why um, people who come to us and ask us to, to program their upcoming um, autonomous vehicle device, their ADAS device, is very enamored with it because they find that this higher level model, less boilerplating, is useful. And the other thing is that it truly gives them back the portability because once they program it for their device, they know that their code can now be ported to some other device, some other FPGA, and it will still essentially work with very little modifications. You don't have to change your code because, oh my god, I switched from a CUDA device to an AMD device, and now I have to switch all my code and all my invocations again. So this ecosystem builds on top of normal applications. You have your applications sitting over some sort of template libraries. And for a long time, this was indeed one of the bane of most heterogeneous programming language, and they still are. Most of them cannot handle any particular templates. It's OpenMP, for instance, it would have a lot of, even though it has a target dispatch offload model, doesn't particularly handle template all that well. It, it, needs, it has to have some, it, it made some, a lot of recent adjustments just to handle RAII. The fact that you have different ways of going in and going out. They fixed it using what's called a reference counting model. They basically, they basically count how often you go in and out of a scope and that way they can know how many allocations you're doing. Below the template libraries, but um, there's also SQL for OpenCL, and then OpenCL, and then finally you can go to any OpenCL-enabled devices. So if you look at one of the, the, some of the prior odds, on the top left you have CUDA, you have OpenMP here, and you have C++ AMP. You might not know exactly each language, but I can tell you that each one of these is non-standard C++ in some ways. For instance, in um, CUDA, you have this, this triple uh, angle bracket, which, which, is, which, which is what they do to get to this range, as well as these global um, tags. Okay? We don't want any of that. We don't want to have any of that stuff. In OpenMP, of course, as you know, it uses pragmas. It's not a natural, it doesn't naturally fit in with the actual normal C++. And that's always going to be hard for error handling and identifying where errors hand, comes from. It conflates the the idea of separation of concerns, because it's telling you in one sentence in the pragma what you're going to do, where you're going to do it. The other thing is that C++ AMP has this restrict keyword. If you know what it is, it basically is a way of saying, C++ AMP, I cannot handle many things that are running on GPUs, like a virtual functions, like exceptions. And indeed, back when C++ AMP was designed, they, the GPUs at that time could not handle these things. You cannot throw an exception, and you cannot use call virtual functions. That is rapidly changing these days, where GPUs now have been enhanced with 
pretty much very similar capabilities as CPUs. So you no longer need this particular um, identifier. And the resulting kernel, this is the code that is executed um, for a GPU on Sickle. It looks at, it's essentially just a library call, okay, calling an ND range for the data that you want, and then calling the actual kernel calculation, in this case, obviously, A plus C, um, back into C for various indexes along the way. So let's see what it looks like. So Sickle, the one thing, one other thing that I talked about earlier was that Sickle also tries to give you control over dependencies of calling kernels. And it does this by doing what's called implicit data movement. And this implicit data movement uses a dependency model to tell you which kernel needs to be done ahead of other, another kernel. Because another kernel might need data from a previous kernel. So they, we do this because we, we have this uh, two systems. One is buffer and the other one is accessor, and we separate it out. The buffer handles data across hosts for one or more devices, and they can create an accessor. The accessor is type safe and, it's, and have properties that define how and when you access data using what's called read writes. So together, this creates what's called a command group. And the command group is the library call that allows you to launch a kernel. You can have multiple command groups accessing a buffer. You can give read and write access info. So you can give it a lot of info for runtime to schedule your kernel. And how you do it is, I'll just demonstrate here, you can have different kinds of accessors. The accessors give you, allow you to, access, to say where you want your data to be stored or allocated on the device. So as you can see, we have to be much more precise on the GPU to say where the data needs to sit on this airplane. And there are, many, there are many of these memory regions on a GPU as I've gone through. There's a host access to data that gives you immediate access on the host, on the CPU. There's global access for the global memory region. There's constant buffer for the constant memory region. That's a portion of the global memory that's read only. And it's often more efficient if we know that you're not going to write to it. So that's why they separate out a constant read only buffer. And then there's a local accessor for local memory for each of your work groups. Now here's an example of the data movement. Let's say you have multiple buffers. The, the, the accessor is going to allow you to say the access pattern, like read, write, or a combining of the two. So the first one here is to read from a buffer A and write to buffer B. Okay. So here I have, I have reading from buffer A, um, writing to buffer B, the first command group A. Command group B likes to read from buffer A and write to buffer C. Command group C it likes to read the results from buffer B and C, and then write the result to buffer D. So Sickle knows that you can access concurrently now command group A and command group B, um, because no one's modifying it. So C knows, but C on the other hand knows that it has to wait until command group A and B are done, okay? And it creates this, it implicitly, quietly creates this, this task graph for you so that you, you don't have to explicitly move data around. Now, in some cases, it is useful to do that. And as you can see, most models out there have what's called explicit data movement. Um, OpenCL, CUDA, OpenMP, all makes you issue these CUDA malloc, CUDA mem copy that explicitly moves data around. Now, that's great if you know exactly where, where things are going and when things are going to be. It's going to get very unmanageable as data get, you get bigger and bigger and get more data. Um, C++ AMP was the one that originally pioneered all of this stuff, where they have this extent that does all the implicit copying, and Sicko essentially falls into that camp. Now, it's not, I'm not saying explicit data movement is bad. We recently implemented um, Sicko on top of, or HPX on top of Sicko. And it turns out that if you're implementing a runtime, like HPX is, is a runtime, Sicko is also like a runtime. They need actually explicit the controlling the data movement. So in that case, if you, are, if you want to be a runtime, you actually need to fully control where the data movement is. So as a result, I can now say that our experiments are telling us that you actually need both implicit and explicit data movements. If you're not implementing a runtime, like most of you guys, your um, application programmer, you probably, want, um, you probably prefer implicit data movement, okay? So that's basically the benefits of data dependency. You basically can stop worrying about low-level handling. You can modify and change, and because now you, 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 you're not worrying about low-level data handling, you can modify and change the kernel quickly. 
try different kernels, adjust the, adjust the results, adjust the actual calculations. It can allow you to do clever things like prefetch while computing on different devices, or leave the data on the GPU if you're going to need it later and you, so that you can save on a necessary copy. On other models with explicit data movement, you, have, you see instruction that says, okay, now I'm done. I need to now explicitly copy this data back to the, C, to the CPU. There's no such thing here in this implicit data movement. Okay, when the buffer is destroyed using the RAII principle, it will automatically bring the data back. Not necessarily immediately, but at the right times as to when it's needed next, which may not be immediately after buffer destruction. So these are, so it tries really hard to follow the C++ um, um, idiom. So now let's look at what we did, do get in C++. As of C++ 17 that was released um, two years ago, what we added was that we didn't add anything for asynchronous agents. We added parallel STL and, of course, controlling false sharing. That's mostly for concurrent collections. And then under mutable shared states, we added things like scope logs, shared mutex, ordering of memory models. But the key thing we added were these things, these things called thread of execution. This is in preparation for GPUs because this is no longer a stood thread. The thread of execution is now an execution agent. That's why everywhere we changed it to these things called TOE. If you hear this name, now you know what that means. It's a thread of execution. We also have these new progress guarantees and new execution policies now, think, thanks to parallel STL. This is some of the most hidden part that was added to C++17 that you won't hear about in most talks. It's because these are things that are precursors to enable GPU execution. You see, up till, you see, GPU execution, as you can surmise from what I described in the hardware, is a very, very weak execution model, even weaker than a relaxed, G, a, a relaxed CPU. It's, 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 it's the most relaxed model there, there, there is. And because of that, now we have um, execution policies that can, in, in effect, allows you to access these kinds of more relaxed uh, memory models. The other thing is that the execution policy has an escape hatch. You have the normal ones, that, which by now most of you guys might be familiar with, like sequential, um, 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 unsequence, and uh, parallel, sorry, parallel and parallel unsequence, which gives you parallel and parallel vectorized. The sequential one gives you like the old SCL. It's all sequential execution of the algorithm. There's, but there's also a place for a vendor policy, and that's where we stuck in the sickle execution policy to say, okay, that's going to the GPU. Okay, so I'm going to show that to you now. But in the, other, the fourth column, you'll see that I've added progress guarantees, thread of execution, and execution policies, because these were the, in, these were the, in, the inventions in this column that are actually quietly there for the GPU executions. We're kind of a sneaky bunch at the C++ standard, aren't we? <laughs> so this is what C++ 17 is giving us. It intrudes to use a number of parallel algorithms and new execution policies and say how they can be parallelized. So now when you cause about 75% of the parallel algorithms, not all of them, because some of this cannot be parallelized, but most can, the, most of the, the ones that you care about, like sort or find if or transform or reduce, they all can be parallelized. I'm gonna show you how to parallelize one of them so you can all go home and do it. But what they give you is these new algorithms can now have unordered execution orders, which gives, allows them to be parallel. So the, the first one is seek for sequential execution policy. And that's the one basically is just saying, do it like before. It's ordered within one thread, okay? okay? Um, it's like the old um, um, STL. And if you don't say anything, you, get SC, you basically get seek. If you say PAW, on the other hand, now it's getting interesting. Now we're now gonna be able to allow you to use all the cores of the CPU, okay? It means that it will be an order across multiple threads, okay? And if you go further and say par unseek, parallel unsequence policy, it means that it's also an order within your own thread. And what that means is now you can also vectorize. Now, what happens if you don't have a vector unit? That's pretty rare these days in most CPUs. Well, it just falls back to the parallel case. And if you don't have multiple CPUs, what happens? Well, it just falls back again to the sequential case. Pretty much what you expect in that case. In that case, we didn't go too crazy on the standard. Now, this is what they look like. 
Let's take one algorithm. Let's look at accumulate and reduce. Now, accumulate basically takes an input iterator, first and last, okay? And then it takes an in initial value and then some binary operations, which is optional. It's usually, if it's a, it, its default is plus, but you can do minus, multiply, divide if you actually put in the, operate, the, the operator. So stood, this basically iterates over each element in the region in order. And this is kind of what its pseudocode looks like, you know, for, um, um, some, for ACC equals the init, then you're going to walk through each element in an open range from first to last in order. You're going to call the binary operation that you give it, plus by default, for the, for the accumulate, for the ACC, for each, in each, each, uh, each iterator. So when you execute this, it looks like this. It walks through each element, takes one element from before, adds it up to the next element, then it takes the next element, add it up to what you guys, what the temporary result is from that element, and it keeps walking down until you get the answer. This is what, C, this is what um, C Sequential is doing. You put some values in there, you add 42 to six, to eight, to seven, to one, to three, to two, to three, you get 30, uh, 72. Basically, 30 more, 30 more values, okay? The reason it has to do this is because of the in-order specification that is under seek. In parallel, however, it can be different. In parallel, you can actually do what's called a reduction. Accumulate is like a reduction in parallel. Reduce is the, the equivalent. But the only difference is that with a reduction, now you can do it out of order. They can be, do, they can be done unordered. Um, so let's take the execution policy, which is up, up here. Once we know what the execution policy you want is, I'm hoping it's par or par unseek, okay? Um, I would now, instead of calling um, in the original body, um, I call binary op, I call this uh, group sum, G sum, I call it, okay? And I pass in, um, the binary, in, the, in, the, in the past, I pass in that, um, that latch, the ACC latch, and the iterator. Here, I pass in the binary op, the initializer, the first, and the last minus one. Okay? Last minus one is because I, I'm actually doing two, op, two accumulations at a time, and I, once I get to the end, I don't want to, to I have nothing more to add. Okay? So let's see what it looks like. Now you can uh, write it, now you can potentially write this in any order. Not just this but I can now do this to it. You see that now what I'm doing is I can actually do things in parallel and so that instead of seven operations, I, I actually only have three operations, okay? You can also, this means that if you have the available concurrency, and all of you do, I can guarantee this, you can do these operations in parallel, you can reduce the number of steps. If you, ha if you have hardware with a lot of concurrency, let's say you actually have a GPU, not just vector on a CPU, you can perform a lot of these operations in parallel. And this is how you do it. Well, you, you can see that if I throw all these numbers in, even though I'm adding them up potentially in different order, I can still get the answer is 72. Now, for those of you guys who are mathematically inclined and knows the difference about um, associativity and cumulativity and things like that, you understand that there's limitations to what I can do. Well, this is because, so here, I can certainly get 72 in both ways with a plus operation, but you'll notice that here, when I switch the operation to a minus, what do you think I'm going to get over here on this side? Probably not 72, right? In fact, I'm going to get 36. I got a wrong result, okay? And like I said, if you guys know math, you know what's going on here. This is because GSUM needs the binary operations to be commutative and associative. This means that I need the operations to be, to be doable and get the same result, no matter which order I do it, I can rearrange the order I need to get the same answer, and I can group them in any particular grouping, I can still get the same order. Okay, that's what associativity means. That's what commutativity means. So that means that it doesn't work with subtraction or division. It only works with plus and star. Okay, no floating points either, because you know that even with floating points, <laughs> things, when things are out of, you add them in different order, you're going to get different accuracy. Okay.
So this is the bane of what parallelism gives you. It gives on the one hand, it also takes it on the other hand. But it does give you tremendous power. So obviously, if it's a reduction, the number of work item being used is going to drop as you go on. And this is the best way to reduce dependency between operations. You can basically take advantage of more parallelism, utilizing more of the hardware. You can structure it to do as many operations as possible and reduce latency by just accessing the local memory. All those intermediate results that are in that reduction accumulation will be accumulated in local memory, okay, and not in the global memory. That's why we need the three different layers of hierarchy of memory in GPUs. And there are dependencies, of course, due to the reduction work still, but we can manage that with barriers. In every stage, the next stage is going to depend on the previous ones. So we need barriers. These, this is where that work group barrier comes in, and not use kernel barriers. We want to distribute the data into chunks the same size as the work group, and then have each work group calculate a partial reduction. And when you have one result, when you finally are down to just one result, you are done. Okay. At, each stage of the at each stage of the reduction, the algorithm literally splits the data in half. Then it takes the second half, literally folds it on top of the, the first half. Okay. It's not the most efficient algorithm, but it's the simplest to cognitively understand so that you can do reductions quickly. And the result is, so what's the sickle code looks like? So this is where I'm going to demonstrate you line by line what SQL would do in this you know, medium, fairly, it's not hello world, but it's also fairly medium complexity. So we have basically a std reduced prototype okay, at the top with a SQL execution policy. You notice that's the escape hatch. I don't call paw, I don't call seek, I don't call paw and seek because all three of those only works on CPUs. They don't mean anything to GPUs. But we know GPUs are coming in the standards, so we built in this escape hatch, and you can now create this vendor execution policy, which I call SQL execution policy, and that means that I want it to go to a GPU. Okay? So assume that the iterators are contiguous. Now, right now, there is still that, remember that, that CPU likes things contiguous memory? GPUs like them strided because you have all these processing elements plugging in, but they're taking it at different strides. And you have to bring them, you have to compute them at different strides, then coalesce them back. This is some of the complexity of programming these things. And now you guys also understand it. So, so basically, we assume that the iterators are contiguous memory, and when you copy the data to the to the GPU, it is contiguous. So things like forward and random access has to be put into a, conti a continuous form. You cannot use forward and random access iterators. So we might need a vector of an array, and this would require that AOS to SOA, the structure of array, array to st of structure transformation. All right, so we've done that. Let's assume we've done that. So the SQL basically separates out the storage and access. I, I, I hopped on that quite a bit on quite a few slides, so let's see if it's actually worth the salt that is gone. First thing we do is create a buffer of value type of one dimension, and then we pass in an input iterator. This manages the data, okay? Pretty simple so far. We now also do this thing called set final data. Um, this, all, all this is sell, saying is we're telling the buffer to not copy back any result. This is because reduction is non-modifying. I don't change the original inputs. They're not modified. Other cases, they're automatically, they want you, they're automatically modified, in which case, when the buffer is destroyed, it synchronizes the result back to the CPU. I don't want this to happen yet until I tell it when I need it. All right. So the buffer manages its data in its lifetime when it's destroyed, when it's copied back. But with set finally, with set final data, I tell it to not do that syn that that synchronization. Okay, that implicit synchronization. Now we create a queue to work on the device. We create a device selector as a function object that describes a heuristic to pick a device. Okay. So what happens here is that we're going to pick a GPU with this selector. We could pick a CPU, but we don't want to. Okay? We're going to loop through all the GPUs you've got, and the system is going to pick one for you. You could pick one, too, if you really want to be specific. But we assume that in this case, it's a multi-GPU programming model. You could have a self-driving car with some NVIDIA device, some AMD device, some imagination devices, some power VR devices. We don't know what. But we don't, we don't control that. This is what are the, some of the beauty of the system, is that it doesn't limit itself to one particular type of GPU. The next thing we want to do is we want to identify the size of the data 
uh, set that you want to execute over. We want to find out basically from the GPU that we picked, or it picked, we could do both, the, what we got to find what's the maximum size of the work group. Remember that keyword occupancy? I want to maximize the occupancy on that work group now. And we want to ask the device basically to give us info on what is the maximum work group size you would like. And we're going to put, create an ND range that is very close or exact to that work group size. Now, each stage of the re reduction is going to return one value, or many. We know that when it gets down to one, it's pretty much finished, okay? Because these things are partial reductions, right? If after the first, now here's the caveat, this is what some of the, the trick learnings that we have from Codeplay are, that we know now, is that if after the first reduction, you've only got 32 elements, do you keep running on the GPU? No, not for 32 elements. Maybe if you have 32,000 elements, do you keep running? But in that case, I can shortcut it and put everything back to the CPU. Remember, CPUs are particularly good at computing about anything from, from one to about 32 elements at a time. GPUs are terrible for that sort of thing. So this is why you have to understand why it's not like a blind, a blind case where you just keep doing it on the GPU, okay? Because each work group could result in a single value, the data size is reduced by a multiple of the work group size. So, we, so um, the device data size is going to be reduced by the work group size. So we basically divide the, work group, the data size by the work group size. The next thing we do is we create a command group. We describe a piece of um, a group where you want a piece of work for a group that you want to do on the GPU. This is the kernel function, the ND range and any dependencies, okay? So the call is gonna be submitted on the queue and then it's gonna pass in a lambda. Remember how I said that C++ 11 lambda basically opened the door wide for us to enable this kind of a programming model? If not, then we would have to use like a std function object or something weird like that, okay? The next thing we do is identify what is the local and the global workspace. The global range is just the data size hopefully, right, because we query for this, how big, is your, how big is your work group size? It's basically every element you have. The local range is the minimum between the data size and the work group size. You don't want to be higher than the work group size, because then you're over-occupying, and you don't want to be less than you're under-occupying. You don't want to put more on the work group than you can manage, and you don't want to put less on the work group than there's hardware resources, because now you've got things that are just idle and just twiddling the thumbs away. So the next, we create an accessor for this work group. This is what manages the dependency and builds that task graph. With the get access, with read and write access, so you can read the input and output partial results. The next part is now we create a local accessor of value type of 1D with, with the property of reading and writing. We know we ha this one has to read and write. And it's gonna target the local memory. We pass in the size, not the buffer. We, and we're gonna create in each group in local memory a number of elements of value of t-type based on the size of the work group. We're gonna create one element of memory per value that you would want to have in your work group. This is all implicitly done in this accessor. The next thing we do is we create parallel for. Now this is where the magic starts happening, where your kernel function is gonna run on the GPU. We want to this guy is going to take two parameters, the ND range that's made of the local and the global range. It's also going to take that lambda, okay, for the function that's going to be offloaded to the GPU. The lambda takes an ND item, which reflects the specs, the space you specify with the ND range to get the local, global, and the group IDs. Now, there's one caveat here, because um, C++ um, lambdas have an arbitrary name. Every f compiler can generate a different name for this lambda. It, is, it does not have a standardized ABI for passing. Now this was the one, I wouldn't call it exactly a mistake we made, but it was unspecified to allow more um, implementations, implementer freedom. So if you compile this code with a different um, host compiler and then, a, and then with Sickle, and Sickle doesn't know what that host compiler is generating for the Lambda name, it's not gonna find this kernel. So to ensure that it finds the kernel, we have to enforce having this kernel name here so that we can make sure that using this kernel name, we know what the name that the host compiler is giving to the kernel, and then the device compiler can read that kernel, okay? Now this is something we can fix later on with reflection, because the reflection can literally query and find out what the name is given 
for these kinds of lambdas. There are other ways to fix it, but most of them will reject it. We ask that maybe, maybe, maybe we can have the ABI fixed so that it can have the same ABI. That, would, that probably was going to encounter too many resistance from all the different CPU vendors. They all want to have a different ABI for the Lambda name. The other way we asked to fix it was maybe we can create name, name Lambdas. Okay? And that is actually getting some support across the committee where some people want to have name lambdas so they can actually call the name. Because right now, as you know, it's pretty hard to actually find out what that lambda is in terms of what its type is, right? You actually cannot. Okay? So with that name, now being a template parameter, we now um, get around this problem with the anonymous nature of lambda ABIs. So now this code here is this scratch. This code is now is running on the GPU. This is the code with the scratch is where we copy all the data from the global memory to the local memory of each work group. We're going to get the global ID to index into the global memory and then the local ID and then just copy it into local accessor. Then we are going to add a barrier to make sure all the data is copied into the work group. Then we're going to loop over the size of your work group and then half it every time. Remember, we, we do half range every time. Finding the midpoint and then take all the element on the right hand side and fold it onto the left hand side until you get down to one. So we only need to work on half range because in each computation, we're actually going to fold over the other one. And this is why we have a statement that says um, only work on the first half. Okay? It's less than the, the, the cutoff offset. I don't need to do the second half because by working on the first half, I will get the second half. Okay? So now it's the actual reduction operation. We're going to take the local ID, the element of the current ID in the local memory, and then take the equivalent of the other ID in the other half and then store that into the current element. Then we add a barrier after each loop to make sure that each stage is complete before moving on. Okay, now the loop's finished. We're left with a single reduction. We get the local ID. We're going to copy that element and then copy it back. When we access the global memory, we use a local ID. If there are 16 work groups, each one of these is gen going to generate a partial reduction. And you want to store them back to global memory contiguously. So we actually take the group ID, which is 0 to 15, and then send it back to global memory. And that's, that's going to automatically allow it to go back into a contiguous memory. Okay, that's, that's a little bit of another trick that we have to do. This basically creates a new size in global memory, which is the size of the number of work groups that we executed. And that's why we do what we do. We make a, finally a host accessor that gives immediate access to the data on the host. Okay, it triggers an immediate copy back from the, CPU, from the GPU by virtue of RAII. And then once the data size has been reduced to one, this means the reduction is complete and we can return the result. And that is the entire operation for reduction. So how many compilers are there? SQL is not a compiler, it's a language, just like C++ is. C++ is implemented by Visual C++, Edison Design Group, GCC, my old Excel compiler, Clang. Now there are about five implementations of SQL. It just exploded in the last month when Intel announced that they are going to upstream to Clang a SQL implementation. My company makes money off of Compute CPP because it can work on any of these, any CPUs, any OpenCL devices, any, uh, as well as PTX for NVIDIA. Obviously, Clang is most likely going to work on Intel devices. Tricycle is by Xilinx. It's an open source implementation, and they're principally targeting any CPUs using a back end that's built in OpenMP, as well as any um, Xilinx FPGAs. There's also Hipsicle, which is going to target AMD and NVIDIA GPUs. And there's this experimental university implementation who implemented Sickle GTX. Unfortunately, I think we hired him, so that's usually, <laughs> that usually causes the implementations to disappear. So a couple of last slides. We looked at how to write a reduction for the GPU in C++ using Sickle. We looked at how the Sickle programming model allows us to do this. And we looked at how this applies to the GPU architecture and why this is important to modern C++. So let's step back and look at our, our, our graph of what C++ will get us in the future. Vectors is going to be into C++ 20. Finally, you will be able to program vectors okay, 20 years after its time. We are still going to have the, um, the lock-free stuff. Parallel loops will now have a four each by virtue of the parallel algorithm. We still will not have heterogeneity. We're working on P0796. It's called affinity, but it's actually meant for um, affinity and distributed. Caches will have the false sharing support from 17. 
when we get new when we get executors, it's going to enable Numa support, okay, and and the heterogeneous and distributed support. TLS, we're working on a new form based on execution agent local storage. Okay, just imagine what it means to have a TLS using a thin execution, a, a small execution thread. And then we're also working on P0797 for exception in a concurrent environment. That is what is coming. So final thing, one more thing. Um, I want to demonstrate the power of using all the MIPS in your machine and using a video. Now you guys already seen, this is what a code would look like if you are executing for just like one CPU core. I don't have any policies there, execution policy. But if I have a parallel execution policy, I can run 2,500 elements on each of those CPU cores. If I add a sickle policy, I can actually execute on the GPU cores. But what if I want to mix and match both? Well, we use what's called a load balancing policy. Now that balances half the stuff on the CPU and half on the GPU. And now you can actually activate all the cores, all the vector units on your machine. That's incredible. And we actually have a, sl a video that sh shows live when we did that at, C at CPPCon. My name is, my name is Michael Wong. Um, but what I need um, to do is move it over to 40. This is my colleague, Gordon Brown, demonstrating live code. So he's testing each, he's, he's setting the execution policies for CPUs, for sickle execution policies, for GPUs. He's an unseek, he's got Paul, he's got seek up there. And now he's running it on, his, uh, on a remote machine back in Edinburgh. It's, it's running approximately four or five times faster than the standard policy of the CPU. So what we're doing is we're running the CPU policy on the GPU. He speaks with a Scottish accent, which I don't understand at all. <laughs> even after three years working in Scotland. <laughs> And then we produce this um, table of the demo results. But he's a really smart guy, so we intuitively understand each other, even though I don't speak Scottish. <laughs> okay, so let's take a look at this slide, what this result says. It says that I've computed this vector unit across this many elements using sequential, parallel, parallel and vectorized, and heterogeneous, not even balanced, not even like, you know, mixing CPU and GPUs. You notice in most cases when the number of elements is small, I get absolutely no advantage. Okay, you can kind of see that the parallel vector is getting a little bit faster. It's not until I got the two to the 19 number of elements that I see a huge all of a sudden jump from 1.83, the, the fastest parallel execution, to 1.01, the fastest parallel vectorized execution to something that's four to, that three to four to five times faster on the GPU. This is with today's standard algorithm, straight C++, and that's the value of GPU programming. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>